very good afternoon to you all, and uh, it's been wonderful uh, meeting with some of you, hearing your stories um, in a formal way and in an informal way. Um, I have met some of the patients who have been associated with the Jane Foundation at previous Jane Foundation meetings, and I must say that um, hearing their stories has helped me a lot in terms of advancing my research. So um, let, let me get the slideshow started. So I'm an assistant professor in the physical therapy program at Wayne State University in Detroit. Um, and the title of my talk is Physical Therapy, um, but my talk is going to focus on a broad range of topics. Um, my idea here is to basically give you a reasonable amount of information so that you can understand your condition better, dysphoral neuropathies better, and be an educated patient when it comes to determining the kinds of physical exercise you want to engage in. So before I move further, I have to mention a couple of disclaimers. First, I don't have any financial interests with any company. Um, secondly, the session is not meant to be uh, a session to provide you with physical therapy advice. Um, the opinions that I will be sharing here are my own. They are based on research evidence, and there are some points that I will be making that are extrapolations of research evidence. So if you want to take some of this information and, in, and incorporate it into your clinical management, into your physical therapy, please speak with your primary care provider, speak with your physical therapist, speak with other members of your clinician team. All right, so who am I? I'm a physical therapist by training. I went through many years of clinical training as a physical therapist and then went to do my PhD in rehabilitation science. So I wear another hat, which is the hat of a rehabilitation scientist. I also happen to be a muscle biologist. And what does that mean? Well, I work in a lab on a bench with cells and with tissues, trying to figure out the connection between the clinic and what we see in cells and in tissues. Also, I consider myself as an eternal student. And I also consider myself as an eternally grateful student. What do I mean by being eternally grateful as a student? Uh, this is about you. It's about patients being the best teachers when it comes to understanding something. Honestly, I would not have developed an interest in dysphoral neuropathies, and I would not have gone anywhere in my research if not for the patient stories that I've heard. So I'm eternally grateful to the patients for sharing their stories. So why am I here? Um, I've not forgotten why I'm here. It's not like you know I'm kind of wandering through the hallways asking why I'm here. But um, the purpose of my being here is to learn, is to actually learn from you, to learn more. Uh, for example, I was speaking with a couple of people yesterday, and I learned that um, they feel extremely cold, um, even when the temperature in the room is not that cold. And I immediately, my mind started working. I'm like, hmm, how is that related to my lab work? So I've, I've learned a lot. I learned a lot from the, the presentations that were done today. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm here, to learn, to learn more. Um, I'm also here to empower myself through the knowledge I gain and to also empower you by giving you as much of the knowledge that I can give you in terms of understanding the condition better. Um, and my advice would pertain more closely to exercise for patients with this neuropathy. All right, so let's start with a story. So I told you I, I do research, and uh, we researchers are a funny bunch of people. So there was this guy, Dr. Z, he did a study on a frog. What he did is he took a frog, he put it on the floor, and he said, jump! The frog jumped. Um, he said, great. He made, he made a note, frog jumps if you say jump. He cut off one of its forelimbs, put it on the floor, banged the floor and said, jump! 
the frog jumped, made a note. With three legs, the frog can jump. He went on that way. Last leg, only one leg left on the frog. Puts the frog on the floor, taps the floor and says, jump! The frog jumps. He says, great. Even with a single leg, the frog can jump. Then he cuts off the last leg, puts the frog on the floor, bangs the ground and says, jump! The frog does not jump. He says, okay, trial one, frog didn't jump. Again, he goes for it, bangs the ground harder and says, jump! Frog doesn't jump. Does it again and again. And he says, okay, that's, that, at that point I can conclude the experiment. And he writes in his notes, he says, once you've cut all four legs of a frog, the frog becomes deaf. <laughs> so I should have mentioned this. Dr. Z's first name was actually Craig. So let's do another experiment now. I'm, I told you, you know, my idea is to empower you. So I'm going to show you a little experiment. And this is called What Will Happen Next? So here on this panel, I'm going to drop... Uh, a raw egg. What do you guess will happen if you dropped a raw egg into the bowl from a height? It's going to shatter. Let's see if that happens. All right. You predicted right. You're a scientist. Congratulations. <laughs> you are already being empowered. All right. Now I'm going to drop a hard boiled egg. Drops. Did not shatter. Okay. Do you want to see that again? Probably not. Let's move on. So what can we conclude from that? A raw egg and a boiled egg respond differently to mechanical stress. So if someone tells you that an egg is an egg is an egg, that's not true. That argument doesn't hold. And what we can also conclude from this is that the nature of the materials determine how that material responds to mechanical stress. So there's something that has inherently changed in the boiled egg that makes it less susceptible to being damaged by the mechanical stress that's placed on it when it's dropped. And these are extremely important points. It may seem like a trivial experiment, but this is one of the key points of my talk today, that you cannot say an egg is an egg is an egg and treat various diseases the same way. And you also have to pay attention to the nature of materials. You cannot expect bone to behave like muscle, to behave like tendon. They are all different. And you have to pay attention to the nature of materials when you think about how they would interact with mechanical stresses. So all neuromuscular diseases are not the same. Egg is an egg is an egg, doesn't hold. So someone might tell you, well, you know, I have this relative who has a neuromuscular disease. He did this and he started getting better. You need to ask them, what is the disease? All muscular dystrophies are not the same. Someone might say, you know what? There is this excellent new experimental therapy that's come, up, come out for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It will work for dysphoronopathies too, because muscular dystrophies, right, they're all the same. No, they're not. Brad mentioned a point about how atelurin would work for certain types of mutations, but not for others. So you've got to keep that in mind. And again, the mechanical properties of muscles, we first talked about the mechanical properties of the egg, and now we're moving to mechanical properties of muscles they are affected in very specific ways depending on the proteins that are missing. So when you lack dystrophin, which causes Duchenne muscular dystrophy, muscles respond in a certain way. When you lack dysferlin, muscles behave in a certain way because the proteins that are there in the muscle confer certain mechanical properties on muscle and that has to be kept in mind. And these rules pertain not only to exercise, but to other things as well. Again, yesterday I was hearing stories about corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are the mainstay of clinical management for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. People have tried corticosteroids for dysphoronopathies. It does not respond the same way. There is inherently something different with the materials. 
you cannot look at all of them the same way. So I do a little project when I teach biomaterials to my students. It so happens that I teach that uh, to physical therapy students about biomaterials. And what we do in the very first class is we actually build a little uh, structure. We call that a humanoid structure. And we build it with just wooden dowels and tape. And we put a little styrofoam ball as well to resemble the head. And this structure can passively stand. It can just passively stand on a surface. But then I tell them, I want you to take that structure and mount it on a motor vehicle, like what they've done here. And we have a little battle of the humanoids. And the point that we try to make with this is twofold. The first point is you need something to provide active force. If you don't have active force being provided to a structure, the structure will just sit. So those cars on which the structures, the humanoid structures are mounted, those cars provide active force for those structures to move around. And what I also tell them is that when they battle those structures like that, due to the forces that are placed on those structures, things change. So a very important point that you can take away from this is that you need something to produce active force. And the active force that we need for movement is produced by our skeletal muscles. That's, that's the connection between movement and muscle weakness. You start losing muscles, you start losing the ability to move. Let's just watch a really quick video here. OK, let's, let's not worry about that. It's, it's about skeletal muscle and how skeletal muscle works. It's a 45 second video. Um, there's an interesting thing about audiovisual presentations. Something will always go wrong. <laughs> you, can, you can bet on that. Anyway, let's, let's move on. So skeletal muscle fibers, skeletal muscle cells, are these multi-nucleated rope-like structures. And what they do is those ropes basically contract. Those ropes shorten. And that enables the whole muscle to come end to end closer to together, and that produces contractile force. So again, I told you, I'm going to empower you, empower you here. We have a muscle that has one, two, three, four, five, six muscle fibers. This is kind of how they roughly look when you look at a muscle side on. So let's say each of these muscle fibers produced one Newton force. So the total amount of force that that muscle could produce is six Newton. One Newton per muscle fiber, six into one, six. Let's say three of those muscle fibers undergo degeneration. They get damaged. The entire muscle fiber undergoes damage. Three of them are knocked out. What's going to happen to the force, the overall force produced by that muscle? It, it will, yeah, it weakens by, by about half. Exactly. Right. You are empowered. You are muscle biologists. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm serious. This is how simple biology is. It really is. So you lose about half of the muscle fibers that you have. You lose about half the force. And when you look at real muscle tissue, when you make what are called cross sections, you take a muscle fiber that's running lengthwise like that, you cut it, and you look at it, you see these ring-like structures. And what you can tell from this image here is that you see nice uniform staining within these circular structures. Each of those is a muscle fiber. And what happens when you have muscle fiber degeneration is that early on in the process of degeneration, you have some fibers that are kind of just messed up. They are not uniformly stained like these fibers over here. They're, they're damaged, they're, they have broken up staining, and they have some of these dark structures as well inside them. As, we, as the disease progresses, as muscle degeneration progresses, what happens is you see a greater number of these empty spaces appearing. So what was tightly packed like this in terms of muscle fibers sitting side to side, here you see that in later stages of degeneration you have gaps. So basically, this is what is happening. You have muscle fibers that are essentially getting punched out, and that results in muscle weakness. So this is the basis for why muscles become weak when we have muscular dystrophies. 
So as a physical therapist, a rehab scientist, and a muscle biologist, I was curious to know how dysferlin-deficient muscles respond to exercise. Because there are these stories that you hear about patients uh, with dysferlinopathies being athletically gifted early on when the, the disease was not uh, manifesting. But then later on, they say that, you know what, when I started working out after I developed weakness, I found that my disease was getting worse faster. Uh, I seemed to be getting worse every time I worked out. So we thought about that a little bit, and I, I asked the question, is exercise precipitating these kinds of changes? So for that, what we did is we used animal models. Some people say, uh, Roche, you know, I, I go by my last name, Roche. They say, Roche, um, why do you work with animals? You should work with people. Well, there are certain problems. You cannot take people, put them in a lab, and say, you know what? I think you might develop severe muscle damage if I do this to you, but I'm going to do it because, you know, I'm a physical therapist. I have to work only with human subjects. And, yeah, you, you might never recover from it, but, yeah, we're going to do it because I have to do human studies, right? We cannot do that. That's unethical. We have to go through a preclinical process of testing animals before we can test people. Thankfully, we have animal models for dysferlin deficiency. So we tested these animal models very similar to how we would test humans. So this is the kind of setup we would use for humans, and this is the setup that we made for testing animals. So what we're doing here is we're looking at the muscles that lift the foot up, that pull the foot up. So this is uh, how we electrically stimulate those muscles to elicit contractions. And what we do after that is that we can perform exercise protocols. In this case, what I'm doing is an exercise protocol that involves what are known as eccentric contractions. Some of you might have heard it. What are eccentric contractions? Well, let me give you an example, okay? I stand on a, on a height, I jump off, my body is actually hurtling down towards gravity. Anti-gravity muscles have to kick in to prevent me from hurtling down to gravity. But what happens is while my anti-gravity muscles are working, my limbs still flex to some extent because they're acting as kind of brakes, but they will yield somewhat. So what is essentially happening is muscles that are contracting forcefully are being stretched. That's, those are called eccentric contractions, plain and simple. So for example, if I ask you to flex, 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 and stretch your forearm the other way, those would be eccentric contractions. Those kinds of contractions are known to be the main reason why muscles get injured. So we performed these eccentric contractions on dysferlin deficient muscle, and what did we see? We saw that we are able to elicit some of those changes that I showed you earlier on in those muscle cross sections after eccentric exercise. So you can see here, lots of muscle fibers kind of punched out and damaged three days after eccentric exercise in dysferlin deficient muscle. And I told you earlier, all muscular dystrophies are not the same, so we wanted to compare this with how dystrophin deficient muscles respond. So this is a model, mouse model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There also we saw damage three days after exercise. But there's something essentially different. And this is what I told you about materials playing a role in key differences between diseases. This is dysferlin deficient muscle, right, right here where I'm circling with the arrow. That is dysferlin deficient muscle immediately after eccentric exercise. This is dystrophin deficient muscle immediately after exercise. Do you see a difference? Can someone volunteer and speak up and say, what, what do you see? More, more damage, exactly. There is more damage in dystrophin deficient muscle immediately after exercise. This does not happen in dysferlin deficient muscle. There's something essentially different about the materials. It matters. So what we see in dysferlin deficient muscle is delayed muscle fiber damage. There is no immediate susceptibility to muscle fiber damage, but something happens over hours and days that causes muscle fibers to get damaged. And that's a key finding. What else do we find? What we find is also that in dysferlin deficient muscle, if you look five days after eccentric exercise, do you see these green 
small structures here. Do you appreciate those? Those are what we call nascent muscle fibers, newborn muscle fibers, baby muscle fibers. It is indicative of regeneration, new muscle fibers forming. We don't see that in healthy muscle after the same exercise load. So what can we conclude here? What we can conclude is that for a given exercise load, dysferlin deficient muscles undergo delayed muscle fiber death. Second, they trigger this new muscle fiber formation. And to us, it seems as though this new muscle fo fiber formation is in response to the delayed muscle fiber death. So what is the consequence of this? The consequence is that animals lacking dysferlin tend to recover slower from exercise. They do recover, and they recover really well. So if we wait for 21 days after a single bout of eccentric exercise, they will recover fully. But healthy animals will recover within about three to seven days. And if we were to deliberately blunt new muscle fibers from forming, you can do that by exposing muscles to X-ray radiation. So when we do that, what happens is recovery never happens fully. So what we can conclude here is that there's something essentially different with the way dysferlin deficient muscles respond to exercise. During those early years when you're athletically gifted, what could be happening is you could be actually damaging muscle fibers and triggering this regenerative response over and over again. It keeps up to a certain point, and then you start running out. There is a slide on that. We'll come to that later. OK, I told you about eccentric contractions. You might say, OK, you know eccentric contractions can be damaging. Can we do activity without eccentric contractions? We, we did that. We tried that. So what we did is we used our same equipment. Again, we are doing isolated what is called dorsiflexion, picking the foot up. And what we did is then we did concentric exercise, exercise where you let the segment move in the same direction as muscle shortening. So here we are not stretching out contracting, contracting muscles. So those are concentric contractions, supposed to be not damaging. And we found that those contractions were not damaging. We, we did analyses on the tissue. We found that those were not damaging. However, science always throws you curveballs. All right? And what we found is that after 12 weeks of that exercise, concentric exercise, exercise that is not supposed to be damaging, what we saw are these fibers that have blue dots, dark blue dots in the center. Those are called centrally nucleated fibers. What does that mean? The appearance of centrally nucleated fibers means that most likely what is happening is you are triggering myogenesis, muscle fiber formation. You are, you are triggering new muscle fiber formation to occur even in the absence of muscle fiber damage. And we don't see that in, um, in healthy muscle. And again, here comes the important point. The materials matter. How these muscles respond to exercise is determined by the proteins that are present or absent. And this is evidence for it. So even in the absence of damaging contractions, you can still have an increase in this new muscle fiber formation, which we think is actually contributing to an exhaustion of regenerative potential. So what is this regenerative potential? I told you I'm going to be empowering you. So skeletal muscle, by nature, does not undergo a lot of a lot of uh, multiplication. You don't have skeletal muscles constantly dividing and multiplying and uh, forming new muscle fibers. They're they are relatively quiet in terms of division. But when you have muscle fiber injury, what happens is these cells that are sitting on the outside of muscle fibers, known as satellite cells, they get activated. They get that damage signal. They get activated. They start dividing, and they form new muscle fibers. So that's the process of myogenesis, new muscle fiber formation. So what we think is happening is that you have 
increased damage for the same amounts of exercise load, and even when you are not causing extensive muscle fiber damage, you are activating these satellite cells that are contributing to new muscle fiber formation. Both these are likely to be the factors that are causing an imbalance in terms of how many muscle fibers you maintain. So let's say you have a certain amount of muscle fiber damage shown by three arrows here. If everything was good, muscle regeneration would kick in, these satellite cells would get activated, they would help replace the number of muscle fibers that are damaged. So it stays in balance. If muscle damage exceeds the amount of muscle fiber regeneration, you're going to have a tip in the scale, and you're, you're going to have a net loss of muscle fibers. And this is most likely what is happening as you get closer to when you start presenting clinically. So what should we do about it? You know, I've given you all this information, so what can we do? Well, in terms of the way I look at it, as a physical therapist, we have an oath, which is very similar to the, to the Hippocratic oath, which the doctors take. And the most important thing is do no harm. That's number one priority. If I don't know what to do, I need to shut up. I cannot tell people, you know what, try this, try that. No, do no harm is first. Second, my primary goal for you would be for you to maintain as much muscle mass and strength for as long as possible. Why? Because we talked about how we need muscles in order to move. And in terms of being empowered, the best thing that you could do is make yourself more knowledgeable in terms of your condition and stay alert to what your body is telling you. A lot of you have mentioned this, and I'm so, so grateful that you're speaking up and saying things about, you know what, I think I should have opted for a wheelchair earlier because I was a fall risk. I was injuring myself. I was even putting others at risk. That's extremely important. Please continue to do that because that will change the way we clinicians and scientists look at this disease. So here are some of the other things that I've laid out. Simple, practical things. Let, let, let me tell you a, another story. My physical therapy students, they'll often tell me, Roche, just tell us what we need to do when we go into the clinic. Just, just tell us one, two, three, four, five, what we need to do. That's not how education works. The way it works is we give you the knowledge so that you are empowered and you decide what is best for yourself. I cannot tell each one of you, you know, based on what I see from an evaluation, this is exactly what you should do. Just, just go home and do this, this, and this. It does not work that way. Things change. Materials change. So you have to be alert to what your body is telling you and work with it. Some broad rules do apply. Minimizing eccentric loading is a good idea. Eccentric contractions happen not only when you jump off of a platform, it happens even when you walk, when you, when you run, when you try to break a fall. So be judicious about how much you load your muscles eccentrically. A simple rule of thumb is if you're working against gravity, you are performing eccentric contractions so please be cognizant of that, minimize it. Few repetitions of concentric contractions, the kinds of contractions where you move in the same direction as muscle contraction, can potentially be helpful. So how would you do that? You would achieve that with the help of an assistant. It's hard to do it by yourself. So if you had an assistant, what you would say is, you would ask the assistant to stabilize your hand. For example, let's say you're doing elbow flexion you would try to take it up, and then when you're coming down, you can ask the assistant to passively bring it down. All right, so what else can we do? Break up activity into short periods. Don't push through the pain. It does not work, it's, it's not good. Um, also, please speak with licensed occupational therapists and physical therapists. They are specialists, they know what to do. Please speak with them, make sure that your physician puts you in touch with qualified professionals. Okay, I'm gonna now talk about a few things that people loosely throw out. Uh, how much time do I have, Elaine? I have a lot of time, okay, let's keep going. <laughs> All right, so people throw certain terms out. And uh, in fact, 
the way I wanted to spell this was actually idioms with a T here. But I, I changed it later on second thoughts. Use it or lose it. People just say this. Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. You know, If you don't work your muscles, they're going to go. Absolute garbage. That's not how things work. You've got to know about the materials that make up tissue. All diseases are not the same. Someone might tell you, you know what, uh, this particular way of exercising works for this particular muscle disease. It should also work for you. That, that argument doesn't hold. You are unique. Even within a group of patients with dysphoral neuropathies, there can be differences. So you have to pay attention to what your own body is telling you. However, I must tell you that movement is a good thing. You want to keep moving. And in fact, when I tell you to try to protect your muscles, it is to enable you to move for as long as you possibly can independently. It's not to deprive you of the ability to move. It is so that you, know, you think long term, you protect your muscles, you preserve your muscles so that you have function for a longer time. Movement is good, and the reason why I say movement is good is because movement prevents secondary problems from happening. It prevents blood from pooling in your lower extremities. It prevents contractures from happening in your joints, meaning joints getting fixed in awkward positions. And there is also something which is overlooked, which is the brain's memory of movement. In order for the brain to remember, brain and spinal cord, to remember how movements occur, movements must be performed. So if you just say, you know what, Roche told me to protect my muscles, I'm just going to sit like this, please, it's not going to work. It's, it's going to ruin the way the brain remembers movement. And you want to keep that. And I want to mention something jo Josh mentioned in his presentation about you know, some of these exciting uh, possibilities in terms of therapies. Don't you want to be ready when there is a therapy? right? You, you, you don't want to have a situation where you've run through your muscle bulk, there's nothing there to change. The materials are gone. There's nothing there to change. You can have the best gene therapy in the world, but if there's no muscle mass left, there's nothing to transduce. You have to maintain as much muscle mass for as long as possible. So instead of use it or lose it, I would change that to use muscles wisely or lose them fast. Here's another garbage piece of advice that people give, give you. Just keep walking as much as possible. Just keep walking. You stop walking and that's it. You just keep walking and you will walk and walk and walk and you can beat this disease. It does not work that way. Okay? So you've got to be judicious about how much you walk. If you walk a certain distance and you feel like your legs are giving out, it means they are asking for rest. When calcium builds up in excess in muscles, it will lead to damage. And this is not just for patients with dysphoral deficiency. It is even for healthy individuals. Sometimes healthy individuals join a group fitness class. They try to do too much too soon, and they end up with a condition called rhabdomyolysis, where they have extensive muscle damage. They have to be rushed to the emergency room because they can die due to renal failure because of that. So listen to your body. If your body is telling you, I cannot go anymore, please listen. That's not a sign of weakness, it's not a sign of laziness. There is such a thing as too much walking, and you've, you've also heard this, exercise is medicine. Now that is not a garbage term, that is true, exercise is medicine. But would any of you just take as much medicine as you, have to, uh, as you would like? Would you just say, oh you know what, I have this bottle of aspirin. Aspirin is supposed to prevent heart attacks. I'm just going to empty the whole bottle today. You wouldn't do that, right? Exercise is medicine. It has to be dosed very carefully. You just cannot take it as you please. I, I already talked about this. If it's good for one disease, it's good for another. The argument doesn't hold. And be very careful about certain conditions that they talk about. There are certain muscular dystrophies that actually get better with age. You cannot take a study done on those muscular dystrophies and extend it to yourself and say, oh, well, you know what? It worked for that person. It's going to work for me. It does not hold. So there was this story that actually was highlighted by the Jane Foundation on their Facebook, uh, Facebook page. Now, this was uh, a gentleman named Michael Melamed. 
a professor of economics from Venezuela. He ran the Boston Marathon. He has a certain muscular dystrophy. I'm sorry, I couldn't get enough information as to what type of muscular dystrophy he has. But one of the symptoms that he has is low muscle tone. And this gentleman finished the marathon, pretty much ran the whole day. Good for him. However, we've got to be careful because, you know, we can't say, you know what, that guy with muscular dystrophy ran the marathon. I'm going to push myself and beat this disease by running a marathon. The chances are that that is not a good idea. So let, let me say something here, and this is, you know, an important point. Now, what is important for you is different from what is important for me. Okay, as a physical therapist who's taken an oath to do no harm first, there are certain priorities that I have. But you may have your own priorities. And your goals and your priorities are the most important thing to you. If you feel that, no, I'm just going to do this. I don't care what's going to happen. I'm going to do it. That is fine and I respect it. Okay? But I want you to make an informed decision. I don't want you to go run a marathon and then say, you know what, I wish someone had told me what is likely to happen to my muscles if I do that. So you are informed now, all right? And I'm the one who told you. So I'm not responsible if, if you choose to do something adventurous like that. All right, let's start summarizing. So this, the, the topic, the, the theme of this meeting has been taking ownership. So in terms of taking ownership, I would say you've got to remember that all muscular dystrophies are not the same. Dysferlin deficient muscle responds to exercise in a very unique way. Please be aware of that. You could reduce eccentric loading by taking breaks. And some of the earlier presenters talked about using things like shoe inserts, orthotics, and other assistive technology. Speak to professionals who are qualified in, the, in these areas and get the best out of technology. The, the technology for rehabilitation is moving forward at the speed of light. Please try to equip yourself with as much of the technology that's available out there. Listen to your body, extremely important. And use muscles wisely or lose them fast. I want to finish with uh, another story. We started with the story of the frog. Here's another story. So in the Bible, there's a story about the wise virgins. This is how that story is called. It's referred to as the story of the, of the wise virgins. So there, was, there were these virgins who actually were waiting for the bridegroom. And what they did is they were not sure how long it's going to take for the bridegroom to come. So they said, you know what? We are going to trim the wicks of our lamps so that we can extend the life of our lamps. There were others who didn't do that. They said, you know what, let's just let it burn. And what happened was the people, the, the virgins who actually trimmed their wicks, had their lamps burning when the bridegroom arrived. And therefore, when it comes to using muscles and kind of being rationed in the way you use it, it's like trimming the wick. You want to keep it going as long as possible. And it, again, it, this is related to the exciting times that we live in in terms of potential therapies that might be able to stop dysphalonopathies in its tracks. And you want to have enough muscle mass to benefit from those therapies. And I'd like to also say thank you to you all. Thank you to the Jane Foundation for inviting me to, to uh, share my thoughts here and learn from all of you. Um, I have someone in my lab who is exceptional. I have to give Special kudos to her. Her name is Moriam Begum. And uh, the reason why I want to specifically mention her is this. Uh, you know, when we go to meetings, when we scientists, uh, clinicians go to meetings, we have uh, this eye-opening experience to a human face to diseases. You know, the Jane Foundation does a very good job of this. They bring patients forward and they say, you know, there is a human side to this disease. Don't, don't get too caught up in your lab work. Think about this from the human side. You've also got to think about research from the human side. We people have lives too, right? My research assistant, Moriam, um, her mom actually has cervical cancer. But she comes to the lab every single day, puts her heart and soul into her work, 
and churns data out com you know, with, with complete, complete attention to what she's doing. And you know, there are stories like this too. There are people in labs who are working who have diseases themselves, who have family members who have diseases, and there is a human side to research as well. And you know, I, I would like you to advocate for us, just as much as we advocate for patients, I would like you to advocate for us specifically for certain things. I would like you to advocate for increased research funding, A, overall, B, for translational types of research. It's frustrating sometimes when, found, when, when funding agencies will tell you, you know what, what you are proposing might benefit patients now, but you know what, we want you to go back and generate 13 different mutant animals and test them and come back to us. This would take 20 years to translate into anything meaningful. If we want to move the field forward, if we want to get things into the clinic fast, they have to prioritize translational research, even if we cannot get too many answers regarding me mechanism. Funding agencies are hell-bent on mechanism. They're like, what is the mechanism of that? What is the mechanism of this? It's preventing progress. It's preventing patients from benefiting here and now. And please advocate for improved scientific uh, science funding for translational research. All right, so at that, with that, I'll leave you all. And I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much.